tap. Um, Miles and I were just realizing this is our fifth nature on tap, which is really fun. I think we started off the first one. There might have been more staff members than actual <laughs> participants. So um, it's really great that we've gotten such a big crowd. Um, and if you like this, you can see the old ones. If you miss the old ones, they're uploaded now onto our YouTube channel. Is that true, Miles? Yep, he says, yes, it's true. You can check it out there. Um, and there's a, um, another one coming up on June 11th. So um, keep going out and sending us your questions. And I did wanna say um, that we get, we've been getting a lot of questions. So if you sent in a question and you don't see it tonight, um, please don't be disappointed. We had to choose and we try to spread out our questions so that it hits different areas of natural history. So it's not just the bird show or the mammal show or the scat show, even though I would like that. Um, so we will try to get your questions the next time. So um, don't worry, keep sending in your questions. We do love to get them and they, they give us a lot to think about. Um, tonight, we have some um, naturalist here to help us out and staff members of the Harris Center um, to answer our questions and maybe we'll go around and have everybody introduce themselves from the Harris Center. So maybe I'll start with Miles. Why don't you start us off? Sure. Hello everybody. I'm Miles. I'm the office manager at the Harris Center. Trying to keep everything running smoothly with the technology and um, the sound and with the programming. So hope you enjoy. Great. Thanks Miles. And maybe we'll head to Jenna. Hi everybody, I'm Jenna. I'm a teacher naturalist at the Harris Center and um, my specialty tends to be about insect related things. So if there's any insect questions, I'll often chime in on those. Thanks Jenna. And Margaret, you're here. She's saying I'm yeah. so happy to be here. This is my first one. Um, so I'm Margaret and I am a graphic designer and I do um, most all of the printed materials for the Harris Center. And I help uh, Miles um, just kind of get the slideshow uh, ready for Ask a Naturalist each week. And it's really fun to see in advance people's questions and discoveries and photos. And I'm usually sitting there going, what is that? So it's great. I'm here so I can find out. Thanks. Great, great Margaret. Margaret makes us look good. I like to say that. How about Jeremy off there in the corner? Sorry, right, sometimes my space bar doesn't unmute. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I, uh, I'm the director at the Harris Center, which means I herd cats pretty unsuccessfully. And I, I come to these so that I can answer some questions about trees if I can. Thank you. I should say meow. <laughs> um, all right, Phil Brown, downtown. Hi, I'm Phil Brown. I'm the Hawk Watch Coordinator for the Pacman Adnock Raptor Observatory in the fall. And um, I generally answer questions related to birds, but um, I'll be, I'm interested in all aspects of natural history. Thanks, Phil. You're, you're, Phil's an all around wonderful naturalist, I have to say, having been out in the field with him. How about Brett? What's cooking? Hi, I'm Brett. I'm a, our science director at the Harris Center and coordinate a lot of our citizen science projects and a special interest in herps, which is reptiles and amphibians. And I'm excited we actually have some of those questions tonight to talk about. So that's awesome. Really exciting. And Eric Masterson sitting by, it looks like he has a big piano behind him. That's my wife's, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. That's my wife's art. She's an <laughs> artist. Um, I'm Eric and my thing, um, I'm a bird guy too, and I don't think there are any bird questions tonight, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited just to listen. I did submit a question for Brett though. Ooh, how exciting. Um, that's great. And I'm Susie Spickle. I'm the Community Programs Director and my specialty, some people like to call me the Princess of Poop. Um, I do love scat and I love mammals. Um, so I think we might be ready to start. Miles, what have you got in store for us? Love it. Okay, so yesterday we spotted a bear in our yard in downtown Peterborough. 
We've seen an unusual amount of bear sightings this year on Facebook. Do you think it's due to people being home and aware? People more likely keeping their feeders out too long, watching the birds since they're home? Or do you think there are actually more bears in this area? If there are more bear in the area this year, is there an explanation for why? Thanks, the Zimmers. And this is from May 14th, 2020. And since um, I'm sort of the mammals person, I'll take this, I'll take this question to start off with. Um, well, there have been a lot of people seeing bear and a lot of people seeing wildlife they haven't seen before and a lot of people hearing birds. Um, there's just, we're home more. So my take on this question is that um, it's twofold. We're home a little, we're home a lot more than we have been. Um, our areas are quieter. There's less traffic. There's even less air traffic. Um, so we're noticing things more. Um, and we have kept our bird feeders out. And what happened was this spring, even though it was a long spring, um, it started really early. It started almost a month ahead of time. Usually, if you go by fishing game, they tell you to bring your feeders in um, from April 1st, and then you can't really put them back out until December. But we had an early warm up, even though it was like, long and kind of chilly, it wasn't cold enough for the bears to really stay in their hibernated dens or spaces. And so they've been up a long time and they're really, really hungry because there wasn't a lot of greenery for them. So they woke up early, but the plants and the animals that they would normally feed on and the food that they would typically be able to find was a little behind schedule. Well, did, there was nothing really blooming or coming up. Um, so they were um, coming into the areas where there was food, which was often bird feeders, um, chicken coops, um, happens to coincide with the time that we pick up our baby chicks from Agway. So a lot of people were seeing bears in their area coming into their spaces because there was um, an early spring. I did double check on the bear numbers for the state of New Hampshire. And actually, um, we are going to be seeing this year an uptick of mama bears and their cubs. Um, that's because in the past few years, since 2018, there was a real big failure of the mass crop. That's acorns and beech nuts and things like that. And that meant a high mortality for bears and a low birth rate for them. And that really lasted um, 2008, 2019. And did I say 2008? I meant 2018, 2019. And now we had a good mast year um, this year. So they're expecting, the scientists at Fish and Game um, are expecting that we'll be seeing some more bears and their cubs. So yeah, there could be more bear. Um, but I think we've just been seeing them more because we're home more and um, they woke up early and we've been feeding the birds and things like that. Does anybody on our staff or panel want to add to that? No. All right. Okay, I think we're good to go. Susie, there are a couple of questions on the chat related to bears. Sure. You want to throw them out, Brett? Um, so Miles got a call at the Harris Center today um, from someone who had a bear eating chickens out of their coop and she was nervous about walking around her property with so much bear activity and wondering if she should be nervous if they um, represent a threat to her. Well, that's such a good question. Uh, bears are big um, and they, um, they're very skittish of humans usually um, unless they get kind of used to being fed by them. I would guess what I would say to that, um, and I, I did read this um, from Fishing Game, is when you get your baby chicks, when you get your chicken coop, um, you should also get an electric fence. That's a really good uh, way of dissuading bears from coming into your chicken area. And that's because you, they, they're smart. And if they get a shock, an uncomfortable experience from a bear, from an electric fence, they they learn that and they teach their young that and then they avoid that. And I know that from keeping bees. Um, sometimes I wouldn't even have my bee fence, my electric fence plugged in and I would find bears kind of in our orchard, but um, not going near the fence because they had associated the, 
the electric fence with a painful um, experience. And we baited the fence too, which sounds a little mean, but we took foil and put peanut butter on the foil. And the bear would nuzzle the foil and it would get a shock. This sounds so bad. <laughs> a shock through its nose and its, its feet are bare. Ha ha, bare feet. Bears have bare feet. Um, so they really get a shock right through them and it's a really good dissuasion. Should a person be nervous about going out if there's bears around their property? Um, my heart wants to say no. Uh, you know, there's very little on record of bear and human, black bear um, and human problems, but there is some on the record that there have been some encounters. I think I would go out and make a lot of noise. I would invite some friends over with dogs. I would, I would secure my chicken coop with electric fencing around it. And I would, um, I would kind of leave my smell and mark all around my area and make a lot of noise. So I hope that answered the question. Brett, was there any other ones? Um, one other was, is there a way to tell if a, a black bear is a male or a female just from looking at them? Well, at this time of the year, um, many of the females will have their cubs with them. Um, so you will normally see the female and there'll be some cubs near them, although they're really good at kind of hiding the cubs. A lot of times they'll send the cub up a tree. Um, so they might be in your area, but they send them up what they call a babysitting tree. But visually, um, male black bears are bigger, but really if you're seeing a, one bear, it's hard to judge. Nothing physically that you can see, um, really, unless... Um, unless you notice that the female is um, nursing. Then you can sometimes see that. But that was a good question. And we do, we only have black bears in New Hampshire. All right, I think we're ready. What's next? Ah, this is a good question. Is This is, what's your favorite spring ephemeral? Mine, stinking Benjamin, a spring ephemeral wildflower. Mine's stinking Benjamin. All right, Eric, was this Eric Masterson or, or an um, anonymous Eric? A yeah, different Eric, not me. Might have been Eric Aldrich. I know he loves that one. He loves Stinkin' Benjamin. And, and um, Brett, you took such a beautiful picture of one of these. Do you want to talk a little bit about Stinkin' Benjamin? Um, sure. We don't have a picture of that one, unfortunately. Maybe unless Miles can pull it up quick. But um, they're also known as Red Trillium. And they're probably, I think, the most easily recognized spring wildflower we have because they have um, the trillium tri, it means three, so they've got three petals and three leaves and they are often found along stone walls and roadsides and all throughout the woods and they're pretty widespread. So I, and I, I feel like because they're easy to identify and they're so beautiful and red, um, people notice them a lot. The name Stinking Benjamin comes from their scent which is, I believe, designed to attract carrion flies, which are their pollinators. Um, I think they're also pollinated by ants, but they want to smell like um, carrion for the um, insects that might be attracted to that. And so um, you, they look beautiful, but they don't smell beautiful. Yeah, and I think I read too that part of the reason they um, have that stinking odor is they bloom before many of our native bees are out. So they need another way to get pollinated and their choice is ants and um, carrion flies. And they do stink. All right, so we took a little survey here. Brett, tell us about your favorite one. I love bloodroot. That's this, um, this flower, these white petals, and, and when it first is coming up, the, there's a single leaf that's often wrapped around the flower. Um, this is, other than colt's foot, is usually the very first one I see each year. There's a spot I go to in Keene near the Ashwilet River that has a, a really amazing hillside of bloodroot. And um, I just think that they're beautiful and I love that they come out so early. Um, and I believe their, their name comes for medicinal use, I think, and also their roots are really red. If you pull them up, they kind of look bloody, I believe. Um, but I just think that they're beautiful, and I think it's amazing that something is blooming as early in the year as these guys are. They're up in kind of early mid-April in some spots. Cool. And yeah, Miles is inviting everybody, if you want to chat your favorite um, ephemeral wildflower in the chat, that would be really cool. Miles, tell us about yours. So pink lady slipper, it looks like it should be in the tropics, but it, it's up here in, in New England. It's an orchid. 
and it's pollinated by bees. And uh, it, it hasn't come out yet this year. I think it's late June, early July is when, when it's blooming. But um, I think it's pretty incredible. It's an amazing looking flower. Yeah, it does. It looks, um, I've heard it called moccasin flower too. It looks like a moccasin. And I just read that they have an association with um, a certain fungus at, um, because their seed doesn't have any, um, doesn't have like an embryo to, it doesn't have a, to feed it, doesn't have like a yolk to feed it or a cotillion or whatever it's called. So they depend on this fungus to give them nutrients. And then once it becomes a trillium, the trillium gives back to the fungus and provides the fungus with nutrients um, as an adult. So it's a really, really cool relationship um, for that orchid. And I guess that's true for most orchids. They don't, their seeds are, are um, come out and they don't have that covering that gives them the food. Cool. All right. Hey Susie, before you go on, I have something to add. Yeah. So a couple people mentioned ants as pollinators of Trillium, and there's some new research, not that new, but newish and more going on that says that ants actually aren't good pollinators at all because they have a natural antibiotic on their exoskeleton that can kill the pollen grains. So they are there to get it purely for themselves. Wow, Jenna. All species, but it is true of most species. Love it. I love the insect stuff. That is really cool. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Um, I think mine was next. I love this beautiful, very, very early spring flower, ephemeral. It's trailing arbutus. Um, it's a low growing plant. It's like a creep, creeping plant. Um, it comes out early, like early April, well, mid-April. And when I find it, I fall on my knees and I sniff it. For an early blooming wildflower, it, it smells so good. And I don't know why, because I don't know who pollinates it, who's drawn to it that has that beautiful smell of like honeysuckle in an apple orchard. It just is wonderful. And if you ever get a chance to smell this plant, you gotta get down on your knees and do it. It's worth a sniff. All right, okay, here's a wildflower I wasn't sure about in terms of ID. Is this a wood anemone before full bloom? It was found on, in Alstead on the roadside. Very tiny blossom, maybe an inch long. This is from Brett. So I'm wondering is- I, I did answer my own question, so I can share it if, unless somebody else wants to weigh in. I did a little digging after I sent this photo to Miles. Um, but it is, it is um, wood anemone, but no, when they open up, their flowers are kind of upward facing and you can see all the petals really easily. But I guess when they first um, come up out of the ground, it's more of a drooping um, flower where you can't see each petal. So at first it was kind of hard to find this in a field guide because the field guides all show the flowers in their kind of mature bloom. And this I think was very early on, so. Um, and I've since found them in a bunch of other cool places, but this was, I always try to learn one new wildflower each year, and this was the one I learned this year. That's really cool. Is there anybody, um, any of the other naturalists who want to share anything, anything from Phil? I know you, you, um, pay attention to wildflowers too. Is there anything you want to add or tell us what your favorite wildflower is? I'll put you on the spot. Oh, well, I would probably agree with Brett that, uh, the bloodroot is a special one for me. So um, I've only seen one so far this year, unfortunately, since we don't really live in a very enriched area locally, um, but there's one growing in our backyard. So I didn't see it flower, but I'm seeing its leaf. So I'll have to settle with that. <laughs> That's exciting. Well, all right, maybe next year. Okay, how long do water lilies live? and? Jeremy, is this from Jeremy? What? Jeremy Wilson, is this your question? Well, that's my foot in a picture asking, what is this thing that my foot is next to? I'm on a, I'm on a remnants, not remnants, but a sort of active area where I'm, I'm uh, trying to manage a beaver issue and constantly cleaning out some drainage and the beavers are sort of running out of sticks and they're starting to bring in these alien looking things. And this isn't a very good picture of one because they get much bigger than this. So sometimes they're 
they're, you know, as thick as my arm and, and probably five feet long. And they've got these kind of eyes in them and they, they just are the most alien looking things. And I, won I wondered who knew what these were. Although I can tell people what they are if they have questions. Wow, does anybody have anything they want to add to this? I had no idea. I thought it was, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was some weird scat that I couldn't identify. Any, any additional comments? No. So, so one can imagine that it has something to do with water lilies since that's in the question there. But I've so seen this, this pond is full of, of yellow flowered water lilies. Is that Spatterdock? Is that right? Splatterdock? I think that's the name of them or one of the names of them. The, the, the yellow flowers on the, on the, the water lilies. And uh, this is the rhizome from those. And they're perennials and so as they get older and older the rhizome just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and uh, it's really extraordinary to see these things and you have no idea what they are until you figure it out. If anyone's dug up a, a violet rhizome it's a lot like that where you can see all these these years of the violet and, and where the scars are from the the buds and the, the stems from the different years show up on them so it's a lot like it's a lot like that kind of rhizome. Wow. Um, well, uh, I have to ask you, is that um, spruce, is that a spruce bough on top of this beaver lodge too? Yes. Well, cause I, I'll tell you from my view as a um, mammals person or interested in mammals, um, you, your job of managing those beavers might be coming to an end. They are really desperate. When beavers are drawn to softwoods like spruce, hemlock, pine, um, that's showing that they have run out of their preferred food um, and they are in kind of dire straits. And I guess that must be true too because they're using the water lily root on top. Um, so they are probably going to have to move on for a while. So this is good news, Jeremy, because I know you managed that. <laughs> have you noticed just walking around um, that area that there isn't really anything left for them to eat? Uh, there, there aren't any hardwood saplings left, but they seem they seem very much to enjoy their spot there and aren't don't seem in any hurry to leave. I'm trying to get them go to go across the road, but they haven't been willing to do it. Yet. Well, good luck. <laughs> That's good. All right, let's see what our next one is. Oh, this one. Oh, this is so interesting. This photo was taken after all the ice had melted. Our dog disrupted some of the detritus on the edge of the pond. A bubble arose that burst into a rainbow of colors and then spread out like an oil slick. Was that from some decomposition during the winter? Any ideas? Any ideas out there? Mm. Jeremy, you want to field this one? You fielded a very similar question in one of our earlier um, Ask a naturalist. Sure. Uh, so I think it's just natural oils in the decomposition of the uh, the material that's in the, the swamp that they're looking at. Um, sorry, I'm having some computer issues here. Brett, can you uh, take over for a second? Because I'm I've got to change my video around. Yeah, so I think if I remember correctly, this is essentially kind of natural, um, a byproduct of natural bacteria related to iron in the sediments. And you often see it in wetlands. And one way to tell the difference between this and an oil slick is that if you, if you break this apart, um, can you stop that for just a second? Um, if you break this apart, <laughs> sorry, um, if you break it apart like with a twig or something, it'll fragment out into little shards. And that's how you know it's the natural kind of um, bacterial byproduct as opposed to something and that's oil. If you, if you kind of touch it with, poke it with a stick and it, it kind of reforms like globs of oil, then that might, might be something else. But a lot of the times when you see these in wetland soils, they, they're very fragile and they, they break up part into platelets all over um, the surface of the water. Very cool. Thank you guys. Jeremy, yes, so, sorry about that, Brett. I'm, I'm, I'm back on. Um, 
the other thing I've heard is that if you, if, if it's an unnatural oil, like a, a petroleum based oil that when you, when you see it, this is difficult because it looks like there's some ice involved there, but when you see it, you see the whole rainbow in the oil versus you only see a few colors if it's a natural oil. In the oil. Cool. Well, it's a reduced prismatic effect in the oil. Wow. Thanks, Jeremy. That's really, hopefully that's, that's what this was probably most likely. So that's good. And yeah, I've, I've wondered that myself and I'm sure other people have as well. Okay. Let's see what's going on in the next one. Ah, number one, this is a two part one. A beaver felled a tree. It is totally separated from the stump. How is it that the leaves have come out? Jeremy, how come? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it's actually, if you'll, you'll see this a lot, if you see it's a tree that's been blown over in the winter, uh, even uprooted in the winter, you'll see that it will leaf out or try to leaf out. And the, the leaves will often get sort of half sized and then they'll wilt and die off. So my guess is that there was just enough uh, moisture and nutrients in the tree for the leaves to flush out, but they probably are already uh, um, shriveled up and, and falling off at this point. I think uh, France so it won't be... last. It's not like they can persist, but uh, for a little bit, the tree can still flush out. It, it, it has enough moisture in the stem to make that happen. I think and the ones that were, it's uprooted where it's still connected by the root, that can happen for a whole season. Francie is here and she has a specimen, I think, uh, part of the branch. Yes, but I. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I can't find my square on all of these, so I don't know how to show you. Um, but it's a, um, it's an aspen. The leaves are not fully out, but pretty full, and they look healthy and happy. And it's, this was like a 40 foot tall tree. Yeah. Wow. Huge. And the leaves all along it are all just happy. I, <laughs> I'd like to know how can this tree, which was totally separated from its base and its roots, um, have real leaves happening? Yeah, I'm, sh I'm shocked. It's a pretty amazing. Well, Jeremy, I live, I don't live far from you. You could come take a look. Oh, that would be great. What, if you can, why don't you keep observing it and see how long the leaves last? Okay, okay. I was going to say, Francie, um, when we meet again on June 11th, you should give us a report, an update. We okay, need, we okay. We need an Aspen update on June 11th. Yeah. Okay. How long can it go? And wasn't, there was like a, there was a crazy story about a chicken whose head got cut off and it lived for like two years. Two years? Yeah, and, and it was like part of a circus, so they took it around. It was the headless chicken. Does anybody put your thumb up if you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, no. there's just a few people. <laughs> My you're you're making that up. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not. Somebody, um, um, Brett or Miles, like while I'm, we're talking some more, look, look that up and send it. Out. All right, so um, Francie, you had another question. She said, where is my bear during the daytime? Well, I, I think that was such a great question um, that I had never really considered. Like, where, do you, where does a giant animal like a bear hang out and that we don't see it? And it actually ends up that bear are um, diurnal. Um, they, do, they are active during the day. Um, much more than we might think, um, we might perceive them as being nocturnal, but they're really not. They're daytime active, and when they are living near people, um, they go into a kind of a crepuscular mode, dawn and dusk. Now, when bear are really hungry, they're like my teenage son who shoots <laughs> sleeping at like two in the morning, but he'll come down and feed. So bears during the day are feeding. And they are grazing as they move along. They're just eating what they can find and they're stopping and resting. So by, while they're awake, um, they are resting 50% of the time. And where they rest is they don't, they rest in secretive places, um, thick brush, 
wetland hummocks is a favorite place, kind of like out in the middle of nowhere, away from people. Um, they will also um, find a tree at the base of a tree and rest at the base of a tree. Um, like in the thicket of berry bushes, um, they'll, they'll rest. Um, and as it gets colder, sometimes as the season progresses, you know, August, September, October, and the ground is getting colder, sometimes they'll make a little bit of a bed um, out of pulled down branches and gathered up ferns so that it kind of gives them a layer between the cold ground and their bodies. Um, so your bear is around, it's just really choosing to be secretive and, and they're, they are, they're, they are, they should be typically not um, adjusted to humans. And um, a, a bear that is coming often into human areas is a, a dead bear. Um, you know, that's what they say, a fed bear is a dead bear. And so I didn't mention this in the last bear question, and I should have, so I'm glad I have another opportunity, but if you're feeding the bir bird still, you should be taking in your feeders um, because that's very appealing to a bear. And they have an incredible sense of smell. Uh, I heard Mark Ellingwood, who's a uh, um, fish and game biologist, describe a bear as a nose attached to a tremendous appetite. And that is true. They can smell, I was going to say, it's like 10 miles away. So if there's something good in your backyard and it's in their territory and they smell it, they're going to come to it. And whether it's chickens or you're keeping your dog food outside or you're feeding the birds, and once they get to your spot and they find it, they're going to come back and check on it because they remember. And if they have young, they're going to teach the young this is a place to come back to. So really, it's good for the bears. You keep them out of your neighborhoods, put your stuff away, keep a clean area, and invest in an electric fence if you have livestock. That's my little soapbox. Does anybody want to add? I do. I do put my feeders away at night, except for the very occasional time that I forget. But uh, one morning, uh, the feeder was empty, so I filled it and hung it out. And within half an hour, I'm talking like 10 a.m. in the morning. Yes. The bear's there. Now, she's about as cute and sweet as it can be, but. Right. I mean, she's right. a big wild animal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she, you know, she's, yeah. And again, that just goes to the power of their um, sense of smell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they are able to smell that, which is just phenomenal. Um, like, oh, Francie's feeding the birds, let's head over there. So it's really, I know it's, it's hard to remember um, if you are feeding the birds to take your feeders in, but definitely try. And at this time of the year, um, as soon as things start to green up, and which it is, and, and we're getting, you know, fruits and things like that, um, they'll come less into people's yards unless they're habituated. Um, and that's what we want. What, we, don't, we don't want bears in our yard. We want them in the wild because so, it never turns out good for the bear right yeah right. all right let's see what's next oh i found this dragonfly along the edge of the pond is it hurts its wings look so crinkled sign david all right jenna this is an interesting look at this i first have to know if that's your david that is my david i thought maybe <laughs> so um as I'm sure most folks know that dragonflies spend most of their life as aquatic naiads um, and they will be car carnivorous and eating all kinds of little creatures in the waterways while they're growing up. And then when they are ready to emerge as adult dragonflies, they'll crawl out usually on some kind of plant matter, sometimes on a rock or a um, you know, stone or the side of the pond. And they will shed that exoskeleton from their naiad stage and they will come out and they it takes them a little time to get all of the blood into their wings. So before all the blood is in all those wing veins, they look a little crinkled. And so it's a pretty amazing thing to see. And so I'm guessing that this dragonfly had emerged from its um, exuvia, we call it, and then crawled away from it and was going to finish pushing all the hemolymph, which is insect blood, into the wings and then it would fly away. 
unless I'm wrong and something went wrong in the process of wing development, sometimes that will happen and it will never be able to fly away and the wings will always be crinkled and it will be prey for some lucky critic. Wow, Jenna, I should tell you, um, this was something we found this morning and we collected 35 exuvae. Wow. They were just all over the edge and they were all the same species and I'm thinking it's this dragonfly and so um, that's really neat. Yeah, so they all tend to, because their adult stage is so short, it's only, you know, depending on the species and the temperature, it'll only be around for a few weeks. They really need to time their emergence so that when they emerge, there's a male or a female for them to meet with. So they tend to emerge one species all within a few days time. Can you just talk briefly about the dragonfly mating wheel? Oh, sure. What I'm talking about. Yeah, so um, you, you probably have all seen two dragonflies attached to each other. Um, they, dragonflies are really, really ancient insect. They've been relatively unchanged on the planet for a very, very, very long time, millions and millions of years. They were much larger um, millions and millions of years ago, but they, other than that, they haven't changed too much. And um, the reason I mention that is because they're one of the insects that does not have internal fertilization because that had not, they had not gotten that far yet. So, um, so the female needs to collect the male's like packet of sperm called a spermatophore. And so he will place it on her body, on her thorax, and then um, grasp her and she will have to reach and grab it. So it's like they get attached in this way. I don't know if I explained that very well. I wish we had a picture. But um, so it's not internal fertilization and then they'll stay together for a little while. Um, often he will stay with her and just hold on to the back of her neck with his, he has these little graspers. Um, and he'll hold on to her so that he can stay with her while she goes and deposits her eggs so that no other male can come along. Because if another male comes along and he has let go, he, that other male can actually reach inside the female, take out the sperm that was just, that she just grabbed from the male number one. And then he, then the second male will be the one that fathers the next generation. So that first male wants to stick with her while she deposits the eggs and then he'll let go. So wow. it really depends on the species, how long they'll stay together. But, um, oh look. Oh, Miles, you are awesome. Look that at that. That fast. Okay, so what we see here is the one that's um, on the bottom, I guess we'll say, with the wings pointing down, that's going to be the female. And you can tell that because the male is grasping onto the back of her head, which at times can actually damage her eyes. Um, and he's holding on tight. He put the packet of sperm on his thorax and she's reaching around to get it. Wow. Uh, and she'll sort of like scoop it into her cloaca and then she will, you know, in a short order, have fertilized eggs. So if he were to let go too soon, another male could come. And I'm not, I've never seen it happen, so I don't really understand the gymnastics of it, how he would scoop out the spermatophore, but apparently it happens. There's a little flagella, which I actually spent a good amount of time Googling once because I wanted to know what it looked like. How <laughs> how the male could possibly scoop out the previous male spermatophore, but it's true. Wow, that is really fascinating. Thank you, Jenna. That was a little sidetrack, but it was so- Yeah, sorry about that. And Miles, thank you for the great photo. Yeah, that's great. Wow, oh, so exciting. Okay, let's see what we have next. Oh, whoa, I'm on. This is my cup of tea. I'm sending these photos for identification by a naturalist. Would love to know what I'm seeing. Thank you. What finds? These are so exciting. I mean, the one that looks like um, a ripped up cat toy, kind of with fur. Yes, that's the one. Um, that's actually a piece of fur um, from something that has eaten it um, and just left the skin and a little bit of fur. And you can find these, and if you have a dog, your dog, is, my dog finds these things and she loves them. Um, and looking at that with the white fur, um, it makes me think of maybe snowshoe hair. 
or I would have to know when this was found because if it was found like in April could have been snowshoe hair or could be something with uh, more of a white, like a white belly, like a weasel, but that's just a scrap of fur. And, and what's really cool about it is um, it's really uncommon to find, uh, oh, Judy says, yeah, early April. It's really uncommon to find a kill site. Um, I spend a lot of time in the woods and maybe three times in my life I've come across a spot where a, a mammal has been killed by something and there's evidence of it, like, you know, a deer, something big usually. But when you find a scrap like this, this is the food chain in action. You are really seeing kind of the leftover. And most likely this is something that, um, yeah, got eaten by something bigger. Um, so we don't know what, um, but Judy, since you're, uh, since you're here, was, are these two separate finds? Is this bit of fur in a separate spot from this interesting long scat? Um, say that again. What do you mean? Did you find these in a similar place or did you find uh, them? I honestly, I'm not sure I can remember. I, it was the same day. I can say that. It was the okay. same walk. But I'm not sure if, I mean, I don't think it was like one after the other. I'm, I'm just not sure. I can't that, remember. That's okay, because um, this scat, I love it. It's classic. It's a it's really classic long. scat. Yes. When you find a scat that's this long, and does everybody see how it's tapered and twisted at the end? Miles is pointing it out. That's very much a key identifier for a canine and then it's segmented. So Miles, if you could kind of point out the segments kind of um, right there, it's sort of segmented down and it's long. Now, um, this is a coyote scat, judging by the size and that twisted end. And it would differ from something like a bobcat, which is also can be quite large of a scat because bobcats won't have typically won't have this twistedness and they'll have more of a rounded look to it. Kind of like, think of your cat litter. If you have a cat and we call them pugs, kind of like little um, segmented that are sort of rounded and softer. Most canine scat has this tapering and then it has these kind of like pieces that are connected in these segments. So that's just an incredible thing. And it makes me wonder if whatever ate the white thing, um, wasn't a coyote, you wouldn't typically find, you know, wouldn't have eaten something and then excreted it right then and there. It takes a while to process, but, um, you know, it, it, it does make me think coyote. Um, does anybody, does Phil or anybody else want to add anything to this scat and fur? All right. Well, I was really excited about this classic scat picture. Thank you. Let's see what we got. Oh, what am I seeing here? This is another. Is this, this is also from Judy. Whoa, I don't know. This is not scat. It's not up my alley. I'm going to ask who the heck knows what this thing is. Phil, do you want to take it? Um, sure. I would take a stab at that. Uh, I would call that false hellebore just as it's leafing out which is an early uh, stream side plant that uh, resembles skunk cabbage, but we don't have a lot of skunk cabbage in, in this area. Um, that would be my guess, just looking at the early stage of it. It has a very ribbed look to it, um, and, it and it will open up and flower. But um, at that point, I would guess that was a couple of weeks ago, at least, maybe. Who, Judy, is Judy, Judy here? She says yes, yes, she's nodding, yes. Okay. Yep, so that, that would be my guess. Was it near a stream? She's not, yes. Okay. So guys, I have to concur with Phil. I used to teach at a stream in uh, Chesterfield, and this is exactly what, it, it was amazing. We'd go back once a week with a class for about three weeks in the spring. And this is exactly what it looks like. Um, and then by, you know, now it would be fully, it was just amazing, the transformation within a few weeks. So, oh, neat. cool picture. Brett, do you want to add anything? Yeah, because I used to think that this was sprouting sk skunk cabbage too, but I think the ha I mean, it, they look very different as full-grown plants. So the skunk cabbage really has much wider leaves, but also as Phil mentioned, the habitat is a really good clue because I see false hellbore a lot along streams and brooks 
and I see skunk cabbage more in kind of flat, low areas that are more swampy, that are um, not moving water quite as much. So it's a, that's a good kind of context clue if you're not sure. Great. Worth that's mentioning you shouldn't eat this plant. It is a poisonous, uh, toxic plant to consume. Wow. Wow. Good job. Thanks, Bill. Bill, does it smell like, does it have a, an odor like skunk? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't usually break it off because of its toxicity. <laughs> and, you know, skunk cabbage, when they're first coming up, they have that really distinctive red and white looking bloom that kind of looks like rotting meat and smells like rotting meat. And these don't have their blooms until later, which is another clue, I think, of the difference between them. Good, good question out there. Does anybody know why it's called false hellebore? Is there a true hellebore? <laughs> <laughs> something for us to research more. Maybe we'll get back on that one next time we see everybody. All right, what we got? We got a couple more. We, or, oh, I'm attaching a photo that I took on the Hiroshi Trail earlier this week. It shows a strange coloration on the water. Can any of the naturalists explain this? Makes making my eyes itchy. Does anybody want to go for it? Brett? You probably see a lot of this. I, this. I think this is the vernal pool that we have along the um, Hiroshi Trail, which is a really sweet spot. And this is a really great example of why when we do our vernal pool citizen science projects, um, one of the reasons we encourage people to go out looking in April and early May, because it's really hard to see beneath the surface of the water to look for amphibian egg masses when the water is completely coated in pollen, which I think is what we're seeing here. And it looks, it has this really cool sheen to it that might just be a, a, a factor of the light, the way the light was shining. But my guess is that this is just pollen coating the surface of a vernal pool. And Jeremy could probably tell you what species it's, of tree it's from, but I can't. Jeremy? I have no idea. <laughs> um, sort of this, I don't know when this picture was taken, but um, it's too early. For May 15th. Home, she so. said May 15th. Oh, so probably uh, 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 oak or, or red, May 15th. So I, I probably red, red maple, maybe. Okay, red maple, wow, good. Wow, that's really neat. Cool, thank you. Let's see what's the next. Oh, I love this, Brett. Oh, this is so exciting. A study came out demonstrating that many species of amphibians biofluoresce glow in response to blue and ultraviolet light. So I bought a handheld blue light and gave it a whirl the other night when amphibians were out and about. Disappointingly, the toads, spotted salamanders, and red Fs I found did not glow at all in this light, at least not from above. I did not illuminate their undersides, but bullfrogs, pipper frogs, and peepers all had biofluorescent eyes. Tell us, Brett. Yeah, I just thought this was so cool. So this study came out a few months ago that um, some researchers in Minnesota looked at 32 different species of amphibian and found that all of them fluoresced in some way in response to blue or ultraviolet light. So biofluorescence is different than bioluminescence, which we're probably more familiar with. So bioluminescence is kind of that glow you see with fireflies or sometimes there's um, bioluminescent algae in the ocean. That's kind of a chemical reaction that produces glowing light. This is different. This is a reaction that happens in response to being um, bathed in, in this case, blue light or ultraviolet light, where these, um, where they absorb that and then re-emit it at a different wavelength. I just learned all this. This is like physics that's a little bit beyond me, but I I've been digging into this. Um, so this study looked at 32 different species of amphibians in different life phases, so tadpoles all the way through to adulthood, and found that they all glowed in some way, although it varied depending on the species. So some of them, and it, the part of their body that glowed also varied depending on the species. So some of them, their bones glowed. They could see their bones kind of glowing through their skin. Some of them, it was just their cloaca, which is the opening where, um, um, you know, urine and also eggs and sperm come out. Um, so interestingly, they did look at some of the species that I looked at and found different things than I found. Um, I didn't really do a study and I wasn't using the same wavelength light that they were, but 
I, I bought this blue light that recommended by Sam Jaffe of the Caterpillar Lab because there's a whole bunch of caterpillars that biofluoresce and he uses these lights to go out at night to search for caterpillars because it makes them much easier to see. They're very well camouflaged otherwise. So I, um, I, I bought one and I grabbed it and I shined it on all the different amphibians I found on the night of May 15th. We had this like really humid, um, we had a huge thunderstorm run, roll through and then it was just wet and humid out. And it was so cool to see the way their eyes responded. And this is a really new area of research. So people don't really know, um, the scientists are kind of still theorizing why. They think it may have to do with communication, that these species are active at times of lower light when, when blue light is more prevalent in the environment. And so it may help them see each other. Um, it may also um, help them with um, predation or evading predation. There's a lot of questions that are unknown yet, um, but I just thought it was um, that is so really cool. fascinating to go out and see our species that we see every day in, in a whole new light, you know, pun intended. <laughs> but, um, so they're, and these guys, only their eyes glowed. Um, and the spotted, I didn't pick up the spotted salamanders and, and shine on their cloaca or their toes or anything, which is what these researchers did. So they may shine or glow in other ways. Um, Great. But I just thought it was really cool. I wanted to share it. Thank you. There were some questions about the equipment you had. And um, Brett, just give us a quick rundown on um, people, what frogs people are likely hearing yeah. now. So, so right now, what we were hearing are great tree frogs are kind of that really loud trill. We're hearing toads, which is like a really extended, like 30 second trill where you, they don't even catch a breath. Pickerel frogs sound so cool. They sound to me kind of like growling or like running your fingers along a comb. And I, I heard them calling this night, but I haven't heard them a whole lot since. I think they needed um, the warm weather. They probably will probably were calling the last few nights. Um, peepers are still going, although they're starting to, to come to the end of their season for, cho for chorusing. And what else are we hearing? Um, green frogs are, are just starting. It's a whole amazing kind of world of chorusing that's happening after dark right now and also in the afternoon on late afternoons. Great. Thank you so much. That was really neat. And I love that you were experimenting with the blue light. I think that's just so exciting. Next time I want to come check it out. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do more of this for sure. Oh, green snakes sunning itself at Rob Reservoir today. How common are they in this area? So I was, I was, I think this is a question probably for me, although Phil, I bet could answer it too. Um, I was so excited to see this picture because I have never personally seen a smooth green snake myself. Um, they're not necessarily rare, but they are secretive. And so they're not often seen and they're considered um, a species of high conservation concern in the Northeast. They're largely dependent on pastures and meadows and really open areas. So as those have declined on the landscape, um, it's theorized that these snakes have also declined. Uh, I found a really cool thing I wanted to share, um, a, a record of this from a professor of science at Keene Teachers College. So way back when Keene State College was um, a teacher's college, who, who wrote that these snakes have been reported at the tree line on Mount Monadnock on top of Mount Stinson in the Whites and at the tree line next to the Cog Railroad going up Mount Washington. So they also are kind of these high elevation snakes, though they can be. Um, but they're, they're one of the ones that I would suggest if you see them and you're able to get a picture to send it into Fish and Game through their New, New Hampshire Wildlife Sightings database because they're not, um, they're not widespread and they're not often seen and, and having those records could be helpful. For, for the biologists. And one last thing I found out about them that I thought was really cool is that they're an egg laying snake, um, but they have one of the shortest incubation periods of any um, egg laying snake in the Northeast. So their eggs can hatch in as few as four days and up to about 23 days. And part of the reason for this is that the females practice what's called egg retention. So before they lay their eggs, they hold on to them longer than other snakes and they may go out and bask and kind of help them develop inside their bodies before they lay them um, to, to give them, you know, presumably make them less vulnerable to predation because eggs of all kinds are, are really easy pickings for predators. So it's um, a really cool snake that I've never seen and hope to see one day. 
That's so cool. Um, that does remind me to give a plug. If you are interested in reptiles, the Harris Center is offering a free online Zoom course on reptiles with John Benjamin, who is, he just is a huge herp fan and really interested, especially in snakes. Um, and you can check it out on our, on our events page of our website, but it starts on June 4th and it's three times. So it's June 4th, uh, I gotta check my date. June 11th and June 18th from three to four in the afternoon. And again, it's free and John's really wonderful um, and he adores snakes so if, and, and turtles. So if this is interesting to you, check that out. Phil, do you wanna add anything about green snakes? Um, yeah, I have a couple of memories of green snakes and I have to say that for kids, for young kids, they're one of the uh, most easy to handle snakes around. They're just really tame and docile and easy to hold. So a good one to connect to if you have little ones. Well, that's good for me because this summer I'm going to learn to pick up a snake. Right. So I'll have to find a green snake. Yeah. <laughs> you can check it and see how I've done later. I still have my fingers. All right, let's see what we've got. A maple tree turned black this spring. Why is this? Jeremy, what is going on? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm having screen problems again. Uh, I think this is a question from Jim, and I've seen maples with black bark like that before, and uh, I've always associated it with uh, a mold, so it's kind of a sooty black mold that forms on the tree. And uh, I asked Karen um, Bennett and Steve uh, Robert, who are, are with uh, um, New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, w what this might be. And so their two responses are this. So Karen says, pretty common to see black sooty mold like coloring on black on sugar maple bark, though I don't think I've seen this happen in one season, but haven't really looked. And she says she went to Mr. Google, and this is what he said blackening on the lower bowl of sugar maples is due to a fungus complex. <laughs> Includes Fumego species and Pulillaria pulanus, plus several others as yet unidentified fungal species growing together on the bark surface. And then Steve added that I agree with Karen, sapsucker, squirrel, and winter damage can cause the trees to wheat during the spring months, same dynamics as sap production for sugaring, and cover the stems with a sugary sap, which is turns out to be a great habitat for mold growth. Uh, he says, we see the same mold growing in the plastic sap tanks at the end of the season. But not a problem for the tree. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm sorry about my dog barking in the middle of that. Um, let's see what we got on the next one. Oh, yeah, this is really, this is good. Um, starting to see turtles along the road. What should I do if I see one? This is so timely. And Brett um, wrote a fabulous article that was in the Monadnock Ledger on um, kind of turtle time. If you haven't seen it, you can um, check it out online. Um, and I think we'll try and put it up on our website. Um, maybe we already have. Brett, want to take this one? Tell us what, what should we do? Yeah, so I took this picture, and in fact, in this case, what you should do is nothing because this turtle was nesting on the side of the road, and when they're nesting, you should leave them alone. However, um, many of them are crossing roads. These um, basically starting in mid-May and going through early July, the vast majority of the turtles who are crossing roads are females, and they're searching for nesting sites. So they need loose, sandy soil. Um, they dig cavities and lay their eggs in them. And in this day and age, it's often, this means roadsides, sandy roadsides. And so it's very common to see turtles on roads. Um, if they're laying nests in, in, the, in the road shoulder, the best thing to do is to leave them be. Um, if they're trying to move across the road, then um, this is when you can really help them because turtles are extremely vulnerable to roadkill. They're slow moving, they can be small and hard to see, and they're really long lived species. So. Um, some species, some of our local species don't even reach reproductive maturity until they're um, 20 years old. 
So if you can imagine, we have these old female turtles that are looking for nesting sites, and those are the ones that are being hit by cars. It really does a number on local turtle populations. Um, roadkill alone can be devastating to turtles. So um, if it's safe for you to stop, if you see a turtle trying to cross the road and it's safe for you to stop, you know, pull over, put your blinkers on, get, and, and, and get out and move that turtle across the road. Um, just pick it up and, and head it, move it in the direction it was heading. Um, for wood turtles like this one or painted turtles, it's pretty easy. You just pick them up around their shell and move them. Um, snapping turtles are more challenging. Um, little ones won't, won't really, um, you can do the same, you can pick them up in the same way for little snapping turtles. Bigger ones, um, they're feisty and they have really long necks. And so you have to do, you do have to be careful of your fingers with them. And with them, the best way to pick them up is from the rear of their shell. Um, they can't quite reach their necks all the way back. Um, or you, some people will, will kind of drag them from the rear shell across the road or drag them onto a shovel or a, a car mat, that sort of thing. Um, but always move them in the direction they're headed, even if it's away from the water because if they're heading out to lay their eggs, they may not want to go to water. Um, and also the other thing that's really important to just get out there is that you should never take one of these turtles home with you. The, the pet trade is a huge, a huge threat to our local turtle populations, especially wood turtles like this one um, or Blanding's turtles. And so you should really you know, leave them in the wild. Um, so what I do this time of year, um, the vast majority of painted turtle and snapping turtle nests happen within 100 feet of the water. So whenever I'm driving this time of year on a road near a pond or a lake or a stream or a wetland, I slow way down and, and really scan for turtles. Those are the places where you're most likely to see them. They don't travel, wood turtles travel a little further. They can really move through the woods several miles, but most other turtle species stay close to water. So that's when you really want to be on alert. Great. Thank you, Brett. That was so helpful. Um, and that is definitely um, this time of the year. This is what we're going to be seeing if we haven't already started seeing it. That's great. And I think, was that our last slide, Miles? Yes. I want to thank everybody for coming out for um, Ask a Naturalist and to remind you to send in your sightings. Um, we have another one coming up on June 11th, same time. And um, tell your friends if they see something, we love getting them. It makes our day. Um, at the end of these, we always, even our, our, as a naturalist, we feel like we've learned something new, which is so exciting. So thank you to everybody. And thank you for Miles for setting everything up. You did a great job on all the technical stuff. And yeah, thanks, thanks for showing up and, and being interested in nature. And thanks to our naturalists. Bye, everybody. Good night.